All right. Can you hear me? Thumbs up? I can. Great. So last week at my home congregation in Hobart, Indiana, we held our annual in-gathering service, which includes our water communion ceremony. Usually we would bring water that we've collected from various places over the year and pour the water into a communal container. It's a simple and yet powerful ritual for me and for others. This year, we couldn't do it. Instead, we had a slideshow of pictures of water taken by members, and our service leader poured water from a cup into a bowl while we watched. It was the best we could do under the circumstances, and I'm grateful for it. But something was lost, I think something essential. Something about being physically present, being with other bodies, carrying the water, feeling it pour out into the vessel, seeing the movement of the water in the flesh, and that feeling that, that you can almost smell the water. All of these sensations add to a sense of being connected physically to a larger world. I'm an atheist and a religious naturalist, which means that I don't look for supernatural explanations of natural events, but I do use other words to describe my spirituality, pagan or animist. While there are pagans who believe in the supernatural, there are others like me who try to bring together an atheist rationality with a pagan sensitivity. My atheism doesn't help me explain what is missing from our virtual water ceremony. Paganism or animism, which is my kind of paganism, helps me explain that something essential, which is lost when our spirituality goes virtual. One part of my spiritual practice involves pouring libations. This is an ancient practice and a modern one. It involves pouring some kind of liquid onto the earth or a stone. The liquid might be water or wine or olive oil. To the ancients, this was an offering to the gods made in exchange for blessings. But since I'm an atheist, the libations serve another purpose for me. I pour libations on special occasions like the solstices, solstices and equinoxes, including the autumn equinox, which is in a couple days. I'll go outside to a special place that I've set aside in my yard for this kind of thing. I will carry a vessel of water or maybe vinegar. I will recite a poem from ancient Sumer about the lamentation of the goddess Inanna for her dead lover. And I will pour the water slowly on the ground. Someone watching this might well wonder what is going on here. Am I just watering my yard in a very inefficient way? Do I have an overdeveloped sense of the dramatic? That may be. But why would an atheist do this? To answer that question, I want to talk about three experiential concepts, interconnectedness, rewilding, and re-enchantment. I call them exper experiential because they are not just in the head. They are full body experiences. There are really three ways of talking about the same kind of experience. And after I explain these three experiential concepts, I wanna offer three practices which might help you experience this for yourself. The first experiential co uh, concept is interconnectedness. And if you're not familiar, this picture is one that I took uh, in Utah at a, play at a grove of uh, quaking aspens called Pando. It's the largest living organism on the planet. It's about 40,000 um, individual trees that are all connected through, through, through the same root system. It's one giant organism. Unitarians will be familiar with the concept of interconnectedness from our seventh principle, which was added due to the influence of pagan and earth, other earth-centered spiritualities within the UUA. But interconnectedness can seem like a very abstract concept until we root it in our bodies and the immediate physical world around us. Conscious breathing is one of the easiest ways to feel our interconnectedness. As we inhale, we are literally bringing the world into us. And as we exhale, we are offering ourselves to the world. It's easy to forget about the existence of air. We treat it like it's literally nothing. And yet it's a tactile presence in which we are immersed just as fish are immersed in water. And this air isn't empty. It's full of matter, even small living beings, some of them innocuous and others harmful to human beings as we are acutely aware of now. And it's not just our breath, our skin, 
is not a solid barrier. It breathes too, and it absorbs some of what it touches. Our bodies are literally crawling with microscopic life forms inside and out, many of whom we are in symbiotic relationship with. And these are just the most immediate ways that interconnectedness can be experienced. We are enmeshed in an interconnected web of reciprocal relationships with a more than human world. These photos come from a book called More Than Human by the photographer Tim Flatch. The ecologist David Abram, who I quoted at the beginning of the service, reminds us that even the act of perception is an intimate exchange between two beings. As we touch a tree, for example, the tree touches us back. We lose much of this sense of interconnectedness when our encounters with the world are limited to the virtual. The second experiential concept I wanna talk about is rewilding. Aldous Huxley, who you may know as the author of Brave New World, wrote an essay titled, One and Many. And there he explains that we moderns are alienated from the uh, instinctive, passionate side of our being and we overemphasize instead our intellective and rational side. I think we Unitarians may be especially prone to this sometimes. Huxley compares the conceptual tool, conceptual knowledge to a tool and participative knowledge to food. The tool can help us get the food, but it's not a substitute for the food. We have a tendency in our culture to overvalue the food, the tool and undervalue the food. We see the world as an object and abstract ourselves out of it as a way of gaining objectivity. This can be a very useful and powerful way of seeing the world. It enables us to have considerable control over our environment. But when this becomes our everyday reality, then we deprive ourselves of the participative experience which alone can sustain us spiritually. Thus, the more controlled our environment is, the less spiritual nourishment we get from it. This is the part of the reason why virtual services can sometimes feel unfulfilling. These are some photos from a place that I find particularly sustaining, um, the Monongahela Forest in West Virginia. So this is why being in nature, especially wild nature, can feel so fulfilling. In nature, we experience a world that is not merely a tool for our use, but which is to some extent beyond our power to control it. Because of this, our intellective self can take a back seat and our participative self can come to the forefront. This is why, why wild places are so important. When we say something is wild, we mean that to some extent it is beyond human control. We are experiencing the rapid disappearances of places that we call wild or wilderness. But at the same time, we're also realizing that in a very real sense, there is no place that isn't wild. There's no place where human power is absolute. Climate change, for example, is just one reminder that our control over nature is always incomplete at best. The term rewilding has been used to refer to the restoration of wilderness areas, uh, such as reintroducing apex predators and keystone species like wolves and bears, where they were previously exterminated. But there's also a rewilding which can happen to human beings. Human beings have become domesticated by our own civilization and technology. We can experience a rewilding of ourselves as we develop our senses and our non-intellective non faculties and seek out intentional relationships with the other than human beings who fill our world. The third experiential concept is re-enchantment. This photo comes from Muir Woods in California. It's a special place for myself and my wife. The line between our ordinary civilized world and the sensory rich world of wild nature can be a very subjective one. To one person, farmland might seem wild in comparison to the urban setting with which they're more familiar. To another person, a state park is more of a human environment than a natural one. The difference between these two worlds is a matter of degree. We don't need to go to a national park to find wilderness. It's possible to find it in unlikely places. This is a photo of a mole that my son and I found in a parking lot um, just last week. 
We might, for example, and we rescued. Uh, we might, for example, find something wild in an office park retention pond or in the cracks of the asphalt in a parking lot. But this requires unfamiliarizing ourselves with the world around us. There's so much that we take for granted that our gaze passes casually over as we rush past. We must look at the world afresh with the eyes of an artist or a child. This is what is meant by the re-enchantment of the world. Our ordinary world is very much disenchanted. As Morris Berman explains in his book, The Re-enchantment of the World, in antiquity, human beings experienced the world as alive and they felt themselves to be a part of it rather than alienated observers. What we call progress is a story of our progressive disenchantment or alienation from the world. In order to better understand the world, we learned a method of separating ourselves from nature, of conceptually stepping outside of nature to become its observers, to see the world as an object. This was a powerful conceptual tool, but it became not just a scientific method, it became our ordinary everyday way of relating to the world. This is why modern life has a way of cutting us off from everything, from the natural world, from other people, and even from our own bodies. The result is individual alienation, social disconnection, and environmental devastation. And it also leaves us vulnerable to the pseudo enchantments of capitalist consumption, addiction, and absorption in virtual technology. Yet we still have a nagging feeling that we're missing something, something essential. The re-enchantment of the world is a return to this sense of essential participation and a sense of kinship with the other than human beings with whom we share the world. Animists and other pagans seek to re-enchant the world through ritual and other ritual practices, ritual, other religious practices, especially those practices which connect us with each other, with our physical environment, and especially with our own bodies. It is, it is in our bodies that the self and the world, the subjective and the objective, blend imperceptibly together. Our bodies are the door which leads out of our minds and opens onto the world. So what am I doing when I pour a libation onto the earth? I'm not making an offering to the gods who I wouldn't imagine would need them, would need it if they did exist nor am I making an offering to the earth or to nature, which would inevitably receive the matter, whether it's water or something else, ine uh, inevitably receive it some other way. Instead, these libations are a way of restoring my experience of connection to the world, of remembering a reciprocity which is always already present, but which we human beings have the ability to intentionally or unintentionally make ourselves blind to. As I pour out the water, wine, honey, or olive oil onto the earth, I create in the form of the stream of liquid, a living connection between myself and the earth. It's a visceral, it's a visual and visceral representation of that connection. In so doing, I experience both an emptying and simultaneously a filling, as if I am both the cup that pours and the earth that receives. Emptying because I'm giving up sus sustenance, which I might take into my body. And filling because my body is already connected with the earth so intimately that I cannot give to the earth without sustaining myself. I don't just think it, the ritual helps me feel it. As I pour the libation and watch the stream of water flowing under the earth and being absorbed by the soil, this connection moves from the conceptual to the visceral, from my mind to my flesh and bones. Now, in the time that remains, I wanna suggest three practices that might help you to experience these concepts of interconnectedness, rewilding and enchantment. The three practices are enchanting the everyday, seeing another being as a thou, and speaking to nature. 
The first practice is enchanting the everyday. This photo is a, of an eco shrine made by a friend of mine, Mark Breen, um, out of natural materials and it's a temporary thing meant to be uh, dissipated through the forces of nature. Enchanting the everyday means creating space for the world around us, even seemingly mundane, intimate objects to manifest as living presences with which we are in intimate relationship. Ritualizing ordinary acts can help us enchant the everyday. Robin Wall Kimmerer is the author of Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teaching of Plants. She's a Native American and a professor of environmental science. And she blends the wisdom of her indigenous heritage, which she has been rediscovering as an, as an adult, with her scientific training. Kimmer writes about the summer as her family spent camping in the Adirondacks and how a seemingly mundane act became a sacred ritual for her family. In the mornings when they were fixing breakfast, her father would take the steaming pot of coffee to the edge of the camp face the rising sun and pour a little out onto the ground, speaking the words, here's to the God of the mountain, or here's to the God of the river or forest or wherever they were. The children learned instinctually that this was a sacred moment during which they should be reverent. Kimmerer explains that this ritual taught her that the world was bigger than human beings, that it was home to other than human beings who are worthy of our respect and our thanks. Now you might think that Kimmerer's father learned this from his native ancestors. Their ancestors did express their thanks to nature with offerings as probably did all of our pagan ancestors. But Kimmerer's family no longer knew those ancient ways. They've been taken from her people by white boarding schools and other forms of cultural imperialism. But still her family found their way, own way to offer thanks to the more than human world. The words were different, Gestures were not quite the same, but the spirit was identical. Years later, Kimmerer asked her father where the coffee ceremony came from, and he told her it started in a very mundane way, just clearing the coffee grounds from the spout. But it became something more, something sacred. He said, eventually, it was just what we did. It just seemed right. That, says Kimmerer, is the power of ceremony. It marries the mundane to the sacred. It turns coffee into a prayer. You can do this with any mundane action. Taking your first conscious breath when you wake, noticing the sun in the morning, holding your hands under the flowing water from your faucet or your shower head, taking your first bite of food, or just bending down to touch the earth when you step outside. Any of these can be transformed from, an, from a mundane action into a way of enchanting the everyday, an opportunity for communion with the world around us. The second practice is seeing another being as thou, as a thou. The mountain that Kimmerer's father poured the coffee out to was not aware of him or his actions, at least not in the same way that we humans are aware. But nevertheless, there was and always is interaction going on between us and the more than human world. But seeing this requires the tricky step of overcoming the subject object distinction, which is our default way of relating to the world. Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says the Senate will vote on a. The Jewish philosopher Martin Buber talks about the distinction between the I-it relationship and the I-thou relationship. And he uses a tree as an example. Encountering a tree as a thou or a you or a subject is different from encountering a tree as an it or an object. This does not mean, he says, looking beyond or within the tree for something like a soul or a dryad, or if you're a Lord of the Rings fan, an ent. It also does not mean anthropomorphizing the tree in the sense of ascribing human consciousness to it. It does mean awakening, awakening our sensual selves to the reciprocal relationship which exists in every encounter. Even, even the seemingly once 
even something as seemingly one-sided as looking at another being is actually an interaction. When we see the tree, for example, we are not doing so in a vacuum. We share the air with the tree. We share the sunlight with the tree. And we interact with the tree through these mediums and the tree interacts with us even when we're not touching it. David Abram explains that this is actually our most natural and direct way of experiencing the world. It's our objectification of other beings, he says, which turns them from thou's into its, which is actually artificial. And while it's our natural way of being in the world, it's not our habitual way of being anymore. We have become, we have become habituated to seeing the world as populated with inanimate objects rather than animate subjects. Seeing and hearing and smelling and touching the world in this way is not easy for us any longer. When we look at a tree, our default way is not seeing the tree at all. We don't see the tree, but our idea of the tree, which we project out onto the world. And we unconsciously fill in the gaps with our ideas of what a tree should look like. It takes an artist's eyes or a lover's to really see. These photos, uh, next few photos are from Gregory Colbert and they show um, interactions between human beings and, and animals in a way that is really unique. It takes a willingness to get our hands dirty, to get up close and personal with nature, to use all of our senses, our eyes, ears, noses, and even our tongues. But most of all, it requires a willingness to be open to receiving as well as perceiving, an openness to being seen when we see, a willingness to be touched back when we touch another being. The third practice is speaking to nature rather than speaking about nature. Language doesn't just reflect our experience, it shapes our experience, including our experience of nature. To a certain extent, our experience is limited by what we can say about it. For example, lacking certain words about, uh, for certain colors may limit our ability to see them. Another example, which is peculiar to the English language, is the fact that uh, although many other languages use gendered pronouns for non-human objects, English only has the gender neutral it but it is not a neutral word. Referring to a human being as an it, for example, is insulting. Calling someone it is a refusal to recognize their subjectivity or their personhood, and it reduces them to an object or a thing. What does this mean for how we relate to nature? When we speak of a tree or a living being, we habitually refer to them as it or sometimes that. We even refer to animals as it when we don't know their sex, and sometimes when we do. Because of this, we tend to relate to these other than human beings as things instead of persons, as objects rather than subjects. And because of this, we feel free to use them without care or respect, without any sense of community or reciprocity. Robin Wall Kimmer writes about this as well. She suggests changing our language as a way of changing our relationship to nature. Specifically, she urges us to adopt a new pronoun as a way of shifting our worldview. There is a long, hard to pronounce Anishinaabe word for living beings, which includes human and other than human living beings. The last syllable of this word is ki, and Kimmerer suggests adopting ki to replace it, using kin and using kin to replace they when we speak about the animate world. So we say of a tree, ki is growing beautifully. And of a grove of trees, of trees, kin are growing beautifully. Coincidentally, ki resembles the words for who in Spanish and in French. And the word kin invokes our relationship of kinship with the natural world. Kimmerer describes this as a language of reciprocity one which recognizes that we human beings are not the only persons in the world. Now, Kimmerer is a scientist and she acknowledges that there's a taboo 
among rational people against anthropomorphizing the natural world. But she says personifying is not the same thing as anthropomorphizing. Anthropomorphizing means giving human qualities to something that is not human. Personifying, on the, on the other hand, means recognizing the person, the personhood of a being and recognizing that humans are not the only kinds of persons. Kimmerer explains that just as it's incorrect to put plants in the same conceptual category with humans, it is incorrect to put them in the same category as paper clips and bulldozers, as if they have no awareness and no value independent of their usefulness to us. Kimmerer even explains, even extends personhood to rocks. This makes sense to me when I think about rocks as part of that complex, self-regulating living system we call Gaia. Though the pace of the life of, rock, of a rock is so much slower than mine, I am nevertheless intertwined with a larger life which includes the flow of, I'm sorry, we are both, the rock and I, intertwined with the larger life which includes the flow of water and air, the growth of plants, and the interaction with humans and other animals. Now here's how you can put this idea into practice. Go outside and find something, a tree or a bird or even a stone, and try describing ki using the pronouns ki and kin instead of it and they. Speak out loud when you do this. It will probably feel awkward at first, but push through that. Even as I wrote this, I had to go back and try and consciously change some of the pronouns that I had used. Pay attention to how you feel, especially how you feel about the plant, animal, or mineral that is the subject of your attention. Now try talking to key rather than just talking about key. Address key as you or thou. Remember that the point is not to communicate with the plant or animal or mineral, which obviously does not understand your human language, but to change how you relate to our kin. Remember not to just to talk, but also to ask questions and to listen, just like you would in a conversation, because this will help put you in a receptive state of being. Talking to a tree, for example, isn't about communicating with the tree using human language. It's about experiencing the communion that is already happening. That is the goal of all of these practices, enchanting the everyday, seeing another being as thou, and talking to nature. Each of these practices has helped me to experience the interconnectedness of life, the rewilding of myself, and the re-enchantment of the world. These practices require no belief in the supernatural, only a willingness to be open to a world that is so much larger than us, a more than human world, full of animate beings who are in constant communion with each other and with us. So the uh, closing is a poem by De David White, Everything is Waiting for You. And I think it's a beautiful expression of the concept of the re-enchantment of the everyday. Your great mistake was to act the drama of life as if you were alone as if life were a progressive and cunning crime with no witness to the tiny hidden transgressions. To feel abandoned is to deny the intimacy of your surroundings. Surely even you at times have felt the grand array, the swelling presence and the chorus crowding out your solo voice. You must note the way the soap dish enables you and the window latch grants you courage. Alertness is the hidden discipline of familiarity. The stairs are your mentors of things to come. The doors have always been there to frighten you and invite you. And the tiny speaker in the phone is your dream ladder to divinity. Put down the weight of your aloneness and ease into the conversation. The kettle is singing even as it pours you a drink. The cooking pots have left their arrogant aloofness and seen the good in you at last. All the birds and creatures of the world are 
unutterably themselves. Everything, everything, everything is waiting for you. Mm -hmm.